welcome to DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Susan Pettit Crossman. On today's show, we'll look at how two urban transportation systems for people with disabilities have been affected by tough economic times. We'll also see how a determined woman is breaking new ground in the world of equestrian competition. And we have results from the Paralympics, which concluded recently in Norway. First, here's this week's disability news highlights. Statistics Canada has released the last of several reports on Aboriginal people. One of the subjects of the report is disability in Aboriginal peoples. The report shows that while 15% of the Canadian population is comprised of people with disabilities, among the nations of Aboriginal peoples in Canada, the number jumps to 31%. Among North American Indians, the rate is even higher at 33%. Another statistic shows that among Inuit peoples, 44% of all disabilities were related to hearing loss. The report is based on surveys conducted in 1991. In Quebec, proposed funding cuts could affect a program that helps employers make their offices more accessible to people with disabilities. 250 people protested outside Premier Daniel Johnson's office in Montreal last week. They say the cuts will mean losing about 500 jobs. The government wants to make budget cuts that will take $4 million from the program over the next three years. So far, the program has helped almost 2,000 people with disabilities in 38 converted workplaces in Quebec. The Quebec budget will be tabled in April. A big obstacle for people with disabilities is the lack of accessible housing. Some people who use wheelchairs can't even get around their own homes. Now in Alberta, the problem may get worse. The province has cut millions of dollars in funding used to support housing projects throughout the province. Susan Smitten reports. Double doses of painkillers enable Cheryl Martin to use her walker. It's her only choice. Her wheelchair doesn't fit through the doors in her apartment. If I couldn't use my walker now, I wouldn't be able to live here, period. And I can't get into my bathroom at all. Cheryl is one of 31 people who've applied for only nine places in an apartment specially built in Red Deer for the disabled. This is the last project for the disabled to get money under a federal provincial cost-sharing program. Alberta's Municipal Affairs Department has cut off funding. The head of Alberta's Handicapped Housing Society says government cutbacks fly in the face of skyrocketing demand. You've got a caseload of uh, 400 new clients every year with disabilities looking for housing and knowing that what they're living in now is just less than adequate. Municipal Affairs Minister Steve West has little to say about the cuts. So if they've got a concerns, maybe they should write me. Wow, is it marvelous? This is Cheryl's last hope. It will be a long time before another housing complex like this is built in Alberta. Cheryl Martin's application was approved. She now has her accessible apartment, but she was one of 31 people who applied for nine units. Since our last show, the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights and the Status of Disabled Persons has come together again. We spoke with the new chairperson, Beryl Gaffney, and with the outgoing chairperson, Bruce Halliday. But our committee has a unique mandate from the House of Commons. The Parliamentary Standing Committee on Human Rights and the Status of Persons with Disabilities was first formed in 1979. While Halliday was chairperson, the committee consulted widely across the country with people with disabilities. He considers the work of the committee to have made a significant contribution to the process of including persons with disabilities in Canadian society. The major success has been a recognition that we have been able to get uh, in, in the public domain and in governments that um, disabled people have a role to play in our society and that if they're given an opportunity to be educated and to be trained, to have suitable housing, to have uh, suitable transportation, they can become tax-paying citizens instead of people who are on some kind of welfare program. And it's to the benefit of our society if we give those people the opportunity to, uh, to, to have a, a, a paying job. Any facilities available where... The new chair, Beryl Gaffney, who also travelled with the committee, says one of the first things the committee has to do is to rationalise its role in terms of human rights and disability. I think probably one of the first things that we need to do is to maybe have... Um, may, maybe have... look at setting up a mission statement, certainly, for both particular areas. We need a two-headed mission statement. 
And I think that once we know which direction we need to go, it will make our role as the committee much more clear. And I, and I don't really see our committee as having a clear defined role of what they want to do and where they're going to go probably until we reach June and then the House will be rising for the summer months. By all means, I encourage any person with disabilities or any person with uh, a domestic human rights or international human rights to contact I and the committee. That's this week's roundup of disability news highlights. When we come back, getting around town. One of the major barriers faced by people with disabilities has been access to transportation. That includes getting around town. Transit affects many aspects of life such as education, employment and recreational possibilities. Access to urban transit has improved over the last decade, but with recent budget restraints some of those improvements are being threatened. We have two transportation stories from different parts of the country. The first is from Calgary, Alberta. Sally Haney has that story. Hello, Irish. It's Andy Bus. Hi, Irish. It's Ed Thompson. For Ed Thompson, doing? the thought of losing Irish and his bus okay. service is disturbing. Thompson says he soon discovered there were long delays There's with the city-supported bus service. He now relies entirely on Irish Cox for quick service and good company. He's just uh, like a sounds funny these days, but a knight in shining armor for uh, people that don't have a lot of friends out there. Um, he'll, he'll do anything for you. In the past few years, he has picked up thousands of passengers, like Mrs. Dexter. She wants to go shopping today. She doesn't seem to mind paying the flat fee of $10. After all, she's a big Irish fan. It's snowing in my hair. This father of three has done big trips, too. He once took a retired trucker all the way to Fairbanks. The 85-year-old man wanted to see Alaska one That's last fine, time. We had a fabulous time. But times change, and so has the economy. Irish says his clients don't have the money for the big trips anymore. You know, they're really paranoid about what the future is going to hold for them. So Irish Cox has spent the last of his personal savings to keep his bus on the road, $20,000 in all. He has also moved his family from their house into a small apartment. Thompson figures to lose Irish is to lose freedom. So the 32-year-old Calgary man is approaching service clubs and companies in an effort to save the service. Our second transportation story is from Toronto. Mel Pazazorski has used the wheel trans system of Toronto's Transit Commission to get to work for the past 10 years. He travels only four blocks from his apartment to a Midtown Toronto accounting firm where he works, but wheel trans wants to know days ahead when he wants to go to work, come home, or needs a special ride. And booking rides have always been difficult. Recently, it's become impossible. A few weeks ago, Pazazorski tried to arrange a ride to his doctor. They gave me a one-way ride, or they said, you have the option, we can pick you up at 5 o'clock. And my appointment was over at 3 o'clock. So I went wait around for two hours. I, they gave me a ride. Pazazorski's story isn't unusual. According to Wheeltrans statistics, the number of rides jumped by almost 7% in 1993, while the number of rides Wheeltrans could not provide because it didn't have the space or couldn't juggle the schedules went up by more than 300%. Nobody knows how many other rides couldn't be scheduled because they were simply too inconvenient. The challenge that we're facing is that there is a, a registrant increase of about 600 people per month. And this is putting tremendous pressure on the service when the budget has been flatlined at a constant level since 1992. But according to Transaction Coalition, which fights for accessible transportation, this problem was solved in Montreal, Vancouver and Calgary through the use of subsidized taxis. By this, uh, the Hickling Report, which was commissioned by the TTC in 1990, 
It recommended subsidized taxis and for some reason which we still don't understand, it was abandoned. It hasn't ever been considered. Anybody in this room who hasn't signed in? Wheeltrans users have become tired of excuses, and when Howard Mosco recently called a meeting at Toronto's Municipal Hall, the community turned out en masse more than 200 people. What you have to start with is ground zero. Everybody who uses the TTC deserves a ride. When one is, is dependent upon a vehicle to get one place to another. The stress level when you have no ride or a one-way ride is to the point where many of you will never understand. I've lost a part-time job because of flex time. I think that the use of subsidized taxis will solve the problem of wheel trends. Well, I've come to the conclusion that it's absolutely essential to make accessible taxis on the street, however we do it. My first point is that the staff, from management on down, have to have a, a commitment in their guts to get us from A to B and from A to Z. The next is that the buses have to be upgraded because they're in very poor condition. We had no heat most of the winter, and you know what a winter it was. There were no heat in the buses, and the breakdown rate is enormous. And the third thing is that the schedulers and dispatchers need to know the city a little bit better so that they can be creative when we call in for a last minute ride. Because our life should be more spontaneous. Transaction Coalition members and other wheel trans riders are currently organizing to attend future TTC meetings. They'll propose the TTC allocate two million dollars in the short term. They also want the Transit Commission to undertake a demonstration project employing accessible cabs. If you have a story about your local transit system, good or bad, we'd like to hear from you. We'll give you our address at the end of the show. When we come back, equestrian equality. Horseback riding competitions, which involve precision and timed events known as equestrian dressage, have been around for a long time. On the other hand, riding programs and competitions for people with disabilities are just establishing themselves. Now, due to one woman's determination, the two worlds are coming together. That's it, Michelle. And Michelle, when you're ready, go forward at a trot at letter M, trying to be accurate, so you have to plan ahead. Michelle Green looks like any other rider training for competition, but she's not. Michelle is visually impaired. I rode uh, off and on since I was a kid, but because of my uh, eye disease, retinitis pigmentosa, my uh, vision de has deteriorated and it's a degenerative eye disease, so my vision continues to deteriorate. Uh, at uh, some point, um, four or five or six years ago, I, I found it was no longer safe for me to ride in a, quote, able-bodied or regular stables. Uh, I didn't feel safe. It wasn't safe for me to be alone with the horse, and I stopped riding. She was able to regain her interest and confidence in riding with CARD, the Community Association of Riding for the Disabled. And at letter C, prepare to walk. Sandy Webster Stolt is her trainer. Michelle practices dressage with her friend, Maria Somana. She won the silver medal in her category at the Nationals last summer. And uh, she's an excellent rider, a good friend, very supportive. And it works out very well, I think, for both of us because uh, horses are gregarious by nature. They like to be with another horse. And so it's easier to work with uh, two people together rather than riding on your own. This is Chuck, he's a gold medalist with me, my partner in the Cantonese. Last summer, uh, Sandy, my coach, <laughs> persuaded me to give competition a try. And uh, so I tried uh, competing on the Entra and Cantra circuits, that's the Ontario Therapeutic Riding Association and the Canadian Therapeutic Riding Association. 
circuits and they run dressage shows in, the, in a series of qualifying tests. And I ended up winning the gold medal at the nationals in my category of the visually impaired. Michelle, although gratified and excited by her accomplishments, felt that she needed more and decided to compete as an independent rider in the dressage show on the able-bodied circuit. I'm hoping to start at the very basic level of dressage tests on the Trillium circuit, which is the Ontario equestrian competition circuit. And uh, my goal is to reach the provincial championships on the Trillium circuit in September. Competing on the Trillium circuit would not only be an important step for Michelle as an individual rider, but it would be a precedent-setting case. No other legally blind person has ever competed on the able-bodied circuit. In order to participate successfully and safely, Michelle requires reasonable accommodation. These are the accommodations that Michelle will require. Number one, she'll need larger dressage letters set at eye level so that she can see them better. Number two, she needs extra time before the event for her eyes to adjust to the lighting conditions inside. If the event is outside, she should be allowed to wear sunglasses so that the light doesn't blind her. Number four, she'll require the test to be read aloud in order to concentrate on her performance. And number five, for safety and to avoid disqualification, borders must be in a solid material, not chain link fence. And all these accommodations fall well within the mandate, mandate of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Michelle faces two major obstacles. The first is financial. Her costs not only include the regular competition expenses, but she also must hire a sighted guide to assist her to ensure both her safety and others. Currently, she has one major sponsor. The second obstacle, and probably one that is of greater challenge to her, is overcoming attitudinal barriers. While the governing bodies of the equestrian world have been extremely supportive and extremely helpful to me, um, we still have to deal with the individual stables which host each show and I'm not sure of the reactions that I'm going to get from the various stable owners, uh, the various other competitors and horse owners because this is so new. People are narrow-minded sometimes and people generally do not accept change and that's what we're doing. We're creating change, we're creating integration. No one's dealt with it yet. I don't think there'll be a problem in the beginning but I think when Michelle starts to do well, which I expect she will, then you may have that person that finished third and she finished second saying, hmm, I'm not so sure I like this person here. But we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Michelle has a strong belief in integration and accessibility in all aspects of an individual's life. She feels that sports and leisure are extremely important components of integration and more emphasis should be placed on them. If I am successful, and I have to say that just being able to participate in this circuit is success in itself. That is the basis, that is one aspect of the success, just being accepted and being able to participate on an able-bodied circuit. If I'm successful in terms of placing well and uh, qualifying for the provincials, I think it'll draw a lot of attention um, and I think it will help change attitudes and maybe make uh, attitudes towards people with disabilities more positive so that people concentrate on the abilities, not the disabilities. And I think it will open doors for people with disabilities who maybe didn't think they could do something, a, participate in a sport. So maybe it will open some doors or give some other people with disabilities some dreams to chase. Michelle Green is still working towards competing in this year's Trillium Circuit. She spent a great deal of time behind the scenes with the Ontario Equestrian Federation and their executive director, Jim Cation. They are working with Michelle Green and her lawyer to help her reach her goals. Joining me now is Marilyn Ginsburg, Michelle's lawyer and fellow equestrian. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Susan. Why is this case precedent setting? 
Well, I guess it's precedent setting because as far as we know, Michelle will be the only visually impaired equestrian to compete in mainstream equestrian events as opposed to parallel events for people with disabilities. What steps do you and Michelle have to take with Jim and the Federation, Equestrian Federation, to make this happen? Well, we've had several meetings with uh, Jim Cation, and Michelle has also met with uh, one of the officials from Cadora, the governing body for dressage in the province, just to work out the accommodations that she needs and to make sure that when she arrives at a show, that the show secretary and the people who are putting on the shows understand that these accommodations are to be made, that the OEF and Cadora have agreed that they're required under the Human Rights Code and that the individual shows will make every effort to accommodate Michelle's needs. Now, with the association or the Equestrian Federation and yourself, do you see anything you've, from what you've learned in, in this relationship, anything that could be done better or easier in the future for others that may be wanting to integrate? I think that Michelle has set up things very well, and I think that the reason that we're not having any difficulties is that she has prepared in advance. The Ontario Equestrian Federation and Cadora have had a lot of lead time to enable the accommodations to be put in place. I guess that the advice that I would give to other competitors with disabilities is to allow people time to get used to the idea, to find out what you need, and to figure out ways of putting the accommodation in place, because it can't be done overnight. And uh, in the future, what do you see for this sort of integration? If you are a competitor with a disability, and your interest is in competing in mainstream events, that that should be your choice. I think that the disability movement is very much like the women's movement. It's a matter of choice and that you shouldn't be pigeonholed into events solely for disabled people unless that's what you want. Marilyn, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your knowledge with us. You're very welcome. We'll be right back. After the media attention surrounding the 1994 Winter Games, North American coverage of the 1994 Paralympics in Norway fizzled. Canada had a decent showing at the Games, finishing 14th overall. We came away with eight medals, one gold, two silver and five bronze. Lana Spreeman showed her stuff on the hill this year. She won four medals. Spreeman thinks this will be her last year of competition. Athletes from across Canada made up the sledge hockey team. They placed third, taking home the bronze. To wrap up, medals went to Lana Spreeman, a silver in slalom and three bronze in downhill, Super G and the giant slalom. Ramona Ho, a silver in slalom and a bronze in downhill. A bronze to the sledge hockey team. And a gold medal went to sit skier Stacy Kohut for the Super G. And that's our show. The deadline for filing your income tax returns is fast approaching. Next week we'll look at how people with disabilities may be able to save some of those hard-earned dollars. I'm Susan Pettit-Crossman. Now here's our address. Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. You can fax us at 416-205-3399. This program is brought to you in part by the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto and the Canadian Association of Independent Living Centres.